America's home for college sports. The UConn IMG Sports Network is on the air with the UConn Football Coaches Show. Tonight's show is sponsored by Connecticut Business Systems, a Xerox company, beyond the expected, by Frontier Communications. Frontier, don't go it alone. And by Last Fly Airport Parking. We've got lots to offer. Now, let's talk UConn football. Here's your host, Mike Crispino. And live from the Hartford studios of WUCS-FM 97.9, this is the UConn Football Show with head coach Randy Edsel. Hi, everybody. Welcome aboard. Mike Crispino with you. Coach and I will be spending the next hour. We'll have a couple of special guests with us over the course of that time to talk about UConn football, which just began its 120th season this past Thursday night at home against Central Florida. And, Coach, for the folks who were not in the stadium and who were not listening to us, let's catch up on what happened there because you've had a chance now to look at what happened aside from the sidelines. How much different does it look on tape when you get there and you sit down and you look at a football game after you coached a football game? Well, you know, when you've been in it as as long as I've been in it, uh, you've got a pretty good feel of what's happened, you know, on on the field. So when you go back and review the tape uh, there's not a whole lot different than what you well at least what I see you know on the field and what what goes on and and everything and um, you know that was just you know so pretty much what I saw during the game was what I saw on tape uh, afterwards and that was a lot of inexperience and some turnovers and you mentioned it to us on the post game shooting yourselves in the foot now you're not the only coach that's used that line a lot of guys use it uh, every week uh, how do you eliminate that? I mean, turnovers sometimes just happen. Sometimes it's careless. Sometimes it's the defense. Well, when you look at the three turnovers that we had, uh, two of them were situations where we had a young man who go, went into the line of scrimmage and did have two hands on the ball but kind of got his body turned around but still didn't have the ball secured uh, tightly enough. And, um, you know, they knocked it out. And then um, on the other fumble, we had a young man make a big play and uh, then going down the field just kind of, I don't want to say got lackadaisical, but lost focus and understanding that, hey, I'm in front of people. There's going to be people coming from behind. I got to put the ball, you know, high and tight and tuck it away. And he didn't do that. And it got stripped from behind. And, you know, then uh, on the interception, we just uh, we just didn't make a real good throw. We had a guy there and we're on the move. And then we just didn't uh, make a good enough throw there uh, to get that in. So, you know, those are things that that happen, and um, they're learning experiences. And what they have to do is is get better from that and uh, make sure, like I said, it's it's something that we showed the whole team. And you know, we went into the game, and as I told our our players that, uh, and especially offensively, because you know, there's there's keys that we had that we had to accomplish to be able to do what we wanted to do offensively, same thing defensively in special teams. And the one thing that we said is we couldn't have unforced errors. And um, and those were those were things that we did, and those were things that ended up not allowing us to be as successful as we needed to be offensively. Yeah, the turnovers were inopportune in location as well as timing. Your first drive was terrific. Down the field you go. Looks like you're heading in to get some points. Then uh, Xavier Scott, a freshman, drops the ball. Then end of the first half, I mean, it's like a hockey game at the end of the first period, right? You don't want to give up a goal. Right. You give up a fumble when you're in the red zone, and David Pindell had a great first half. And that throw, I don't know, he looked like he threw across his body a little bit. It wasn't his best throw of the day. And then Kyle Buss gets deep in, you know, UCF territory. Looks like you're going in for more points, and and the fumble ensues. So sometimes it's it's kind of where things happen to some degree. Well, yeah. I mean, when you take a look, um, we we controlled the ball 38 minutes. Now they we let them score way too fast, but we had 10 drives in the game, and um, you know we scored uh, uh, three times. We punted twice. And then the other five drives, you know, we had the three turnovers and we gave it up twice on downs. And all five of those drives were within the plus 36 yard line going in. And so there you had five opportunities that you were down in the scoring zone and you come away with nothing. And when you're playing a top 20 team, a 25 team like UCF, you can't afford to give up those opportunities and not capitalize when you have that opportunity yeah David Pindell had a terrific game a lot of folks who came to the football game said wow 
what a difference from last year. And I saw a little bit, little bit of it in August watching some of your scrimmages uh, at stores. He looks like a more confident guy. He looks like a guy that knows what he's doing, what he wants to do. His timing looks better to me. Yeah, he, he's more comfortable this year. There's no question about that. I think John Dunn has done an outstanding job, you know, with David and getting him to understand things in terms of um, what we want to do offensively. And also, um, you know, this, what we're running is very similar to some of the things that he did when he was in junior college and just in terms of the reads. And, and um, so, again, you know, he did a really good job. I thought that uh, there were times that he did a really good job of uh, the pocket was breaking down a little bit and he saw the seam and he got out and ran. And, 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 and for us, we're going to have to do that. I mean, um, we, have, we have guys that, uh, you know, maybe don't have the great speed. So David becomes one of our better playmakers. And so what we have to do is we have to utilize his abilities to help us uh, be able to score points. And when the quarterback runs the ball, like they do in college quite a bit, you know, the fans sit there and they say, well, wait a minute, let's not get this guy hurt. And you were talking about it uh, today in, in the media sessions up in stores that, you know, it wasn't all planned. Some of it is the quarterback's option. If he doesn't see what he wants to see in the passing game, he takes off and runs. So uh, how do you view that? You, you, I don't know. I know you don't want David Bindell running the ball, what, 22 times a game, but I, I got to believe you liked what he did. He ran for 157 yards. Yeah, well, I mean, it, when you have that ability and, and you're a guy that's, you know, on the team that can make plays and take advantage of his skill set, and that's uh, that's coaching. And you know, there's there's some that are designed runs. There's some that are uh, uh, run pass options, uh, and then there are some where he makes something happen because of um, something broke down. And uh, you want to be able you want to be able to have a quarterback uh, that can do those sort of things because everything is not always going to be uh, clean and perfect. And when it isn't, and you have a young man who's got that kind of ability, it puts a little bit more pressure on the defense as well. Yeah, it certainly does. Football's not a perfect game. No, Am not I from, right in from saying any, that? from any uh, stretch <laughs> of the imagination. <laughs> There's 22 players out there. Anything can happen. All right, we'll be right back. We've got the coach Randy Edsel with us. This is the UConn football show on the UConn IMG sports network. I'm here with John. At the clear. All right, 30 seconds, Mike. You can just take it once the highlight concludes. Yeah, I got it.
Welcome back to the UConn Football Coaches Show. It's time for tonight's high-speed play of the game, presented by Frontier Communications. Frontier, don't go it alone. Here's Pindell under pressure, rolls to his right. Looks downfield, going to run the football. Cuts inside and into the end zone. David Pendell from 15 yards out, and the Huskies have their first second-half touchdown. And that was David Pendell for the UConn Huskies. He had a historic day, 157 yards on the ground. Mike Crispino along with the coach, Randy Edsel. And, Coach, a lot of the folks I've been running into around the the state talk about the roster you have and how young these guys are. And the numbers are staggering. 11 true freshmen on opening night, eight playing on the defensive side of the ball. And that ranks nationally. That's the fifth most freshmen to be playing in a game in the first week of the college football season. So is that by design or is that out of necessity? Uh, Necessity. (laughs) You know, I mean, when you take a look at our roster, 70% of our uh, scholarship players are freshmen and sophomores. You know, so that's got to be probably in the top five in the country in terms of, um, you know, where we are. And it's, you know, that's just the way it is. And when you look at those guys, the – you know the the you know they're they're the best guys they they're inexperienced and they got youth but the only way they're going to get better is by playing and you know we still have to roll guys in there um, to keep them fresh and we will but um, you know and I, and I thought for the most part they did a, a a good job for their first college game against the top twenty five team um, you know they they hung in there now what you want them to do is get uh, you know get better this week. And how do you accelerate? I wanted to ask you this today, but I'm going to ask you right now. Can you accelerate the growth of a young player, a freshman who's never played college football, or does it just have to be as time goes on, they pick it up piece by piece? Yeah, I mean, that it, you know, experience is the best teacher. And, you know, some of them aren't strong enough yet. Some of them don't have enough weight on them yet. But this is the situation that we're, we're in. And as a coach, I've always believed that you play the best guys uh, on the team, regardless of you know their their age, and um, uh, that's why we practice the way we practice. We try to go good against good as much as we can. We go with the scout teams to give them the look of the opponents, but you know we do uh, group stuff and individual stuff where we go good against good. So you, know, you get some of those young defensive linemen to go against Matt Pert. You go against uh, uh, Ryan Crozier. And so those are the better guys that we have, Cam to George. So they're going to get better going against them in certain drills and situations than if we just go scout team all the time. Yeah, this is a team that uh, is young, obviously. That's what we're talking about. But I noticed as camp rolled on, you started to move some of these freshmen up in the depth chart, and it surprised me. I, I felt like, hmm, looks like Coach wants to play these guys because he's moving them up. He's telling them you're good enough to be – maybe starting on opening night, and they did. I mean, guy like Travis Jones, I know you've talked about him, number 57, 6'4", 350, a New Haven kid. Uh, how did he do in his first game? Do you, do you grade players? What do you do when you look at film no, on we, someone like yeah, him? No, we grade every play. Each coach, each position coach is responsible. We grade every play for their performance and their technique and uh, chart uh, if they had a missed assignment, if they, you know, if they had a tackle or whatever, and we do that, and then um, – we evaluate them in terms of their performance, and we sit down and go over it. And, you know, one of the things is I was probably going to start those guys last week, but then I just felt that the uh, stage might have been a little bit too big for them. So we ended up uh, starting some other people, but now that they have a game under their belt and they got it, fi- you know, they don't have it figured out yet, they won't by the end of the year either, but um, they have that game under their belt. Now they at least know what to expect. And now you put him in those starting roles. Yeah, Kevon Jones, another guy, four, number 48. He's a linebacker. He's a freshman, all state kid from Connecticut and East Hartford. Uh, when you are playing freshman, what are, are you looking for at the end of the day, at the end of a game? What do you say to yourself about, well, so and so, I think he's going to be good or he did some good things? How do you grade people like that? Well, you, you look at productivity and. You know, one of the things is, and when you watch practice, I mean, you saw uh, KK who would be able to do some things that the other guys couldn't do. I mean, 
if you take a look when he went in, did he make mistakes? Yeah, he made he made quite a few mistakes, but he also made a lot of plays too. He made plays that some other guys might not be able to make. And you see him go up and take a guy on and shed to get hit and shed. You know, that's something that, uh, you know, was, was pretty impressive. Same thing with Travis. You know, one of the things with Travis, we got to get him to be quicker off the ball. You know, he's not as quick off the ball as we want him to. You know, and, his, and, as, and as he gets the technique down and everything else, he's got to be a force to be able to be blocked, you know, up front there. And, uh, you know, the same thing with Jonathan Pace and Luau. And, you know, Caleb Thomas, who was a redshirt freshman who played for the first time. So, yeah, when you're, when you're playing four true freshmen, basically, well, three true freshmen and one redshirt freshman up front, you know, it's not always going to be as pretty as what you <laughs> would like it to be. But, again, they're the best that we have. And, you know, one of the things that I think that they found out was, you know, we try to make practice a lot harder and tougher on them and then the game – you know, is, can be a little bit easier for him because you're getting more breaks and everything else because of the TV timeouts and, and all those sort of things. But, you know, for the most part, I, I thought those guys, they tried, and that's what you're looking for. Who are those guys that are out there giving you everything that they have? And as, and as long as they do that, you know, we'll work with them and get them up to speed on the fundamentals, the techniques, and uh, rec- trying to recognize things. And, and, again, when you look at it, you know, these, these guys are coming from high school. They didn't, they didn't sit down and study film and, and study their opponent and know what they were doing. I mean, th- this is all foreign to them. This is like taking foreign language. And, you know, they're, 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 and it, we only get so much time with them. And so they have to do a good job on their own. And this is where we talk to them all the time as freshmen. you got to understand, you, you can't have a social life during the football season. <laughs> you know, you really That's can't. True. You can't. Because, you know, you got God or your faith is number one, your family, and then it's academics, football. And, then, and if you start putting social ahead of any of those things, you're not going to be very good in any of those. And so they, especially, you know, with what they have to do, and that's something that's a learning process for them that they have to go through. And some of them are going to have to, some of them learn the hard way. Some of them learn it quicker than others. Yeah, let, let's talk about the psychology of coaching because you said something earlier today up at, up at stores about young players trying to figure out what needs to be done. And you said, I got to get guys comfortable by being uncomfortable. And I still didn't quite understand it. I I also failed the missing player test that you gave. So I have to go to detention on that. Someone wasn't at practice. You brought it up. You asked the question, who wasn't at practice today? And none of us knew. Uh, It was number 92 who had to go to class. Guy trying to graduate. Give him credit for that. So he wasn't there. But anyway, you said that. Coaches, you know, you, you're trying to get comfortable, get a player comfortable by making them uncomfortable. Give me some more on that. What, what is that? Well, in this day and age with young people, you know, when I grew up, you didn't have cell phones. And you really, up until maybe five years ago, now all these kids, they have cell phones, but all these kids nowadays are growing up with cell phones. Okay? So – they never are put into a position in my mind that they're uncomfortable because they can hide behind things. They can text people. They can, um, when they go to talk to, and this was the, one of the things that I said, I can just remember in high school, you know, if there, there was a girl you wanted to date and you had to call her on the phone, you know, all of a sudden dad answers the phone. Well, who's calling (laughs) <laughs> and you know, well, this is Randy, and then so now all of a sudden, Randy, here, who? <laughs> here, here you might be seventh, eighth, ninth grade, tenth grade, and here you're talking to, you know, the the the, the father, and so you're you're a little bit uncomfortable doing that maybe, and because now you're talking, and he's he's trying to figure you out, you know, okay, do I want this guy really talking to my daughter, or you know, those sort of things, and that's what I'm saying. But then you got to get comfortable because you learn how to do that. Kids nowadays don't do that. Because they hide behind text messaging, they hide behind uh, Instagram, they hide behind all these things. They're never put into uh, un- uncomfortable positions, and so now all of a sudden they come to college, and especially being involved with a uh, a football program, and I'm sure it's the same thing in basketball and and all those sort of things too. Now all of a sudden, the demands are a little bit different, okay? And they're not used to that. They're not used to being uncomfortable. They're used to having being entitled and being enabled. And being told how good they are and not having to, to maybe work as hard because they were able to get away with it. 
you know, the recruiting starts way too early. They've been told how good they are mm. since they're, they come out of the womb, you know. And so that's, that's the thing that's, that's, that's tough. And that's where recruiting is so important and finding those kids that have that chip on their shoulder already, you know, that aren't uh, the prima donnas, that aren't enabled and aren't entitled. And, you know, because, again, in our sport, in football, it's going to be un- – it was uncomfortable out there today. But guess what? You know, that's we have to prepare to, to go win a game. And if you can't be uncomfortable but feel comfortable because you know what you're doing and you can go out there and execute – you have no shot to win. Yeah, more on this because I, I want to go back to another thing you said earlier today about guys being told they made mistakes, how they handle that. Today it's a little different. We're going to get into that with Randy Edsel, the coach at the University of Connecticut. More on the football show with Randy Edsel on the UConn IMG Sports Network. UConn Football Coaches Show. For more Husky football talk, here's your host, Mike Crispino. And welcome back to UConn Football at Boise State this Saturday night, late night, 10.15 Eastern Time, 8.15 local. We'll get into Boise State in just a minute. Just going to finish up on our previous topic with the coach, Randy Edsel. Coaching today versus when you started coaching, how much different is it and dealing with kids who have to be molded and have to be taught to do something a better way as a player or as a student, whatever it may be, what are some of the landmines there involved now for you as a coach that maybe you didn't have to face 15 years ago? Oh, it's different now. Let me tell you, it's a lot different. And, you know, when you have guys like um, Alfred Fincher and Terry Colley and uh, those guys come back and sit down and, and talk to you and, and tell you, that, you know, hey, coach, I appreciate everything you did for me because if you didn't do what you did, I wouldn't probably be where I'm at today. So you know you, did, you were doing the right things, but it's very difficult in this day and age. Um, you can't handle kids the way you used to handle them, in my opinion. Um, there's, there's other ways that you have to go about doing things uh, with these kids to try to, you know, get them motivated. And a lot of kids – you know, a lot of kids nowadays are not as motivated, in my opinion, as they used to be, because they've never had to, they've never had to go out and put together games themselves. Everything is parent-driven rather than kid-driven. You know, and it's um, participation. Everybody gets a trophy, and they've been told how good they are and everything else. And 
And that's where when you get your program where you want it, you know, you should bring these kids in. You know, and what they ought to do is make all freshmen ineligible like they used to so they can learn how to do things, you know, the right way. Um, but, uh, you know, it's different. And, you know, some of the things that, you know, now you got 20 hours with them. And when you take a look, I mean, you you know, you've been to practice. I mean, we, we start practice at 830 or whatever, and we're done at 1030 because that's what the rules tell you, you know, and you have to count. We count weightlifting. Some schools don't count weightlifting. We do. They say it's optional. Well, that's not optional. You know better than that. But And so you don't have as much time maybe with these kids as you used to. So now you have to be very efficient in terms of what you do, and you really have to be very uh, concise in terms of what you're asking them to do because a lot of kids' attention spans aren't what they used to because, you know, all they do is it's the phone. The phone is more important to them than other things. It's amazing. They'll come off the practice field. The first thing they do, they go check their phone and see how many messages they have or how many people liked whatever they tweeted. You know, there's, there's so many of those distractions. So, you know, it's the world we live in. You just learn to deal with it and, and uh, do the best you can and, and let those kids know that, you know, if you really want to be good, this is what you have to do. Yeah, great players are self-motivated, aren't they? I mean, you have this leadership uh, council you put together with 13 players, and you were just talking about the fact that sometimes – you need the players to be uh, to really police what's going on on the squad because sometimes your peers are a little more demanding than the coaches can be these days. Well, exactly, and so, that's and that's where you. That's why I don't think you can have like one or two guys just be captains anymore because kids aren't put in leadership roles anymore. They don't like I said. Where do you see guys going out in a neighborhood and having a pickup game? You don't see it. You know, it, it just doesn't happen anymore because. The, they have other distractions. They have other things that they'd rather that they'd rather do now because you know with the phones and and all those sort of things. So, but so you got to have that. You got to try to create that leadership uh, amongst your team and have those guys. You know, again, make sure things are going the way they they should be going. Can you tell how that's going right now so far with the leadership council? I know it's been in play for about five or six weeks. Yeah, it's good. I, I've done it before and. And again, you know, we had a situation where Kevin Mensa said some things after the game. And, you know, I talked to Kevin and, you know, if, though, if you believe those things, he thought some guys were getting down, mm. you know, when things didn't go well. But and I everything understand. Else. You understood what yeah. he was saying, you know, right? He I, wasn't you know, saying Kevin, Kevin meant, negative things. Kevin, Kevin was right, maybe right in what he said. He just maybe didn't present it the right way. But again, you don't air your dirty laundry, you know, in that situation. If there was an issue... You know, you come in and we'll handle it and all that. And we talk about those things. But, you know, and that gets back to the other thing we said, you know, with these kids, you know, you got to try to develop, you know, you want them to be confident. And we talked, one of the things I talked about today was sometimes these kids think as soon as you correct them that you're getting all over them. No, you're trying to help them be the best they can. And, you know, you want them to be confident. You know, we're to the point now where, you know, we want to see if they're, if they, um, have the courage of their conviction that if they know so now we said well would you block that guy for well if they can't say well coach that's what i was supposed to do you know that's what we want them to say not well uh uh you know things like that you know that's where the confidence and with young kids that's what you have to do is get them to be confident and hey if you did it right say that you did it right and if you believe in it say that you you know you did it that and that's all part of the process that you have to go through when you got a bunch of young guys yeah you also were quoted i'm quoting you here coaches can't be crutches in a game what do you mean by that well the thing is is you know i think what happens is with the young guys sometimes we as coaches might try to do too much during you know like we have meetings with them then we go out we have individual we have walkthroughs you know separate periods where we go through things well then when they get to the team to me the coaches can't say anything you know we can't say okay you know be loud and say check that you know there's a check there you know they got to do it because if they're not doing it there in practice it isn't going to come out in the game and because you're walking through that, and then it's the pressure. We can't be the crutch for them. We're not going to be out on the field playing with them and standing behind, you know, standing behind them and all that. They got to do that. And that's what I'm saying. Sometimes in practice, maybe you, you do too much rather than them having to figure it out and them communicating and do it. And then you show them the film afterwards. See, when you don't communicate, you give up big plays. Yeah, bingo. There goes six points. Good, good stuff. Communication with Randy Edsel, the UConn Football Coaches Show. More to come in just a moment on the UConn IMG Sports Network.
Connecticut Business Systems, a Xerox company. The, the, the competitive nature that I have. Mm -hmm. We, the ones versus ones, when I say ones versus ones, it was one offense versus one defense, specifically inside run. That's when that's when it got real. And yeah. Finch can attest to that. I mean, helmets fly off. And we fit, we fought. Like, we were allowed to physically fight. Like, yeah. Randy was like, listen, this is where it gets real. Gloves are off. <laughs> Mouthpieces and gloves are off. And we would, we would smash heads and we would just compete to the point where we would fight. And Randy said, all right, well, after the second whistle, you guys got to stop fighting. Yeah. And so we'd fight, and then the intensity's picked up, and, you know, Finch's like, no, let's do it again. And like true competitors, you want to continue one up in the next person. So it was like, okay, you stopped us, let's do it again. You know what, coach, let's go do goal line right now. And Finch is like, let's do goal line. And Dan Rossi's talking trash. <laughs> Finch is telling Dan, listen, Dan, like, we can't hit you, but TC, we can hit you. I'm like, well, you can hit me then. then it's, it, it, but then it was, it was that, that bond of, like, being in the trenches with with your with your teammates, competing and want to one up each other. That's Terry Cauley, the former running back for the University of Connecticut. See, coach, the quarterbacks they always instigate, but they don't want to get hit. No, but and I so tell you, so getting everybody excited. But I tell you what, though, that you sit here and that gives you goosebumps because that's the way it should be, you know. And we've lost that in our society a little bit. And um, you know, hearing those guys, you know, hearing Terry talk about that and everything else, and that's exactly the way it was. There was tremendous uh, competitiveness, and guys hated to lose and hated to be one-upped, and they weren't going to allow it to happen. And that's, and that's what we're trying to get back. Yeah, I think you can do it, no question about it. Here's a guy that was part of all that in the uh, 2002, 3, and 4 seasons, part of 23 wins, a captain in the 04 team, the first year in the Big East, the first bowl game, Motor City Bowl. Ryan Krug, he wore number 73, an offensive lineman from Pine Beach, New Jersey, a Jersey guy with us here on the UConn Football Coaches Show. Ryan, how are you? Good. How we got? How we doing today, guys? Very good. Coach is uh, sitting here and he's reminiscing, and he just had goosebumps thinking about you knocking guys on their backsides in practice. How much of that actually happened, and how much of that was Terry Cauley making it up? <laughs> I would say that uh, that was a good bit by Terry there. It uh, brings back definitely some uh, some good memories and some great times up there. But uh, you know, kind of like what Coach touched on earlier, you uh, when I was up there, when we were up there. You always wanted to compete, and uh, at, at most, you never wanted to get embarrassed. So, uh, 
you put everything you had into it. And, uh, you know, even if you did get knocked down, you made sure you're right back up in the first person in line to go again because I never wanted to be embarrassed. I think that's where my motivation came from with a lot of stuff we did up there. Well, there's no doubt about that, Ryan. This is Coach. How you doing, bud? Good, Coach. Good to hear from you. Good to see you, too. Yeah. So, um, no, I mean, it was – I know you're going to be coming up uh, for the Rhode Island game, and uh, but, you know, we were talking about things. And, you know, I, the, the one thing that I always appreciated about you is just how hard you always went and – the leadership that uh, you always displayed and you had that, that toughness about you. And, and uh, you know, if I know if I needed anything, I could come to you and tell you and you'd take care of it and I wouldn't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Yeah, you know, it's, uh, I just, uh, you, know, it's, uh, you know, like I said, listen, Terry, definitely brings back some good stuff, but I always knew that uh, you know, I might not have been the most heavily recruited guy or anything like that, and I kind of got into the game late there in high school, but... Um, uh, you know, I, I think I had I had more heart than talent, and that probably carried over a, a, a lot onto the field in my demeanor and uh, mannerisms and how I uh, handled myself and uh, went about things. Ryan Krug with us, number seventy-three, an offensive lineman with the UConn, going back. Uh, well, that's that's almost sixteen years when he first got there, two thousand two. And coach, in the break, we were just talking to Randy Edsel, uh, Ryan, about. You mouthed off to the coach, and he didn't mind it. He would tell you stuff, and and if you barked back the right thing, he'd be fine with that. Is that was that unusual, or did that happen a lot around that Husky team? You know, it wasn't that it happened a lot, but there was uh, you know, the other guys used to bust my chops a little bit for that because you know sometimes you need to um, stand up and say what needs to be said, and it might put yourself in a bad position with the headband, but. You know, at the same time, if you're expected to be a leader and you need to show people that, uh, you know, you you have a role that you're trying to maintain and certain things need to be done in a certain aspect that, uh, you know, if you want them to follow you, you need to, you know, step up and do things accordingly. And that also means if, uh, you know, sometimes you might have to step outside of the box to do some things that are going to be uncomfortable or might put you in a bad light. But if it's for the betterment of the team, and you're doing it to help everybody reach their goals, that's what you got to do when, you know, it wasn't as if I was doing it in a bad-natured way. I think uh, Randy's a smart enough guy here where he could see the uh, ends to the means. And so, uh, you know, I'm sure that's as to why he allowed it. But I'm sure other people probably wouldn't have been given a uh, a uh, grace period as I was given. But, uh, you know, I think that also has a little bit to do with when it goes back to what we just stated. You know, you put the effort out there, you lead by example, and, uh, you know, Good things will happen as long as you keep. Uh, it's an effort sport, so you got to give effort in everything you do, whether it's leadership on the field or you know people watching what you're doing. You, you, you got to make sure you're putting putting your best foot forward. Uh, so well, and there's, a, and there's always a method to the madness. There were sometimes I wanted that to happen too, and I knew that I could get him. You know, it wasn't rehearsed or anything like that. But if I knew that we needed something to do something along those lines, I knew how he would respond, and I knew it would be good for for the whole team. And I knew, you know, how he would respond. It wasn't disrespectful or anything like, but that's part of the psychology of coaching and what to do to help your team. And, and hopefully then give other guys confidence, not that, but I knew that I could challenge him and, and, and push Ryan to a point where I could get out of him what I needed, but it would also benefit our team because of what he would do and what he would say uh, and I think between him and Al Fincher, those were the two guys that I've been around the most that could do those things because there's things that you needed to do, you know, and it wasn't us, me against them or anything like that because then we'd turn around and we'd laugh at each other and, and all those sort of things. But sometimes as a coach, psychologically, there's certain things you, you have to do, and, and it was great having a guy like Ryan that you knew that you could go to and, and, and make that happen because all it did was make your team better, and that's the bottom line. And it, like I said, as a coach and as a leader, you got to be able to push the right buttons, you know, and, and when you can push the buttons of people who have the respect, you know, of their, of their teammates and maybe get them going a little bit or see, hey, I, you know, if I just work that hard and I do that, I can have that same kind of confidence and, you know, have that same situation come for me. And, and again, it's because you trust people and you knew that they put the time and effort in and you knew that everything that they were still doing was going to be in the best interest, 
you know, of the team. Yeah. Hey, Ryan, you, you were around uh, when the transition came from uh, – where UConn was when Randy Etzel got here to where they got to. And tell me about that period because it, you had to have some doubt. You had to say, well, what are we doing here? Are we going to get to FBS level? Are we going to have success? Uh, I mean, you, you probably didn't think about bowl games. Then you start getting bowl games. So tell me about that period of time for the team and, and trying to make a transition from where you were to being an FBS legit college football program. You know, I think that was uh... – at the very beginning, when I came, when that, when his first recruiting class came up there, and it's your first year out of high school, you're away from home, uh, you're playing college football, and all of a sudden you're uh, you're thrown out there, and it's you're you're still kind of a boy playing against a bunch of men, and you're trying to find your way, and you know there's a lot going on, and that was a long first season, and uh, you know you learned a lot of good lessons and uh, they carried us over through the course of our career there. And it showed you, and it kind of laid the foundation for everything that, you know, you know, this isn't, you can't just walk in and show up and expect to win and anything. And no matter if you're a five-star recruit or just uh, some guy who was lucky enough to, uh, you know, go on there and you impress people enough and you've got to walk on spot, you know, you got to put your time in, you got to put your effort in, you, you got to, you know, go through the daily grind and everything. And then, you know, kind of did that, and we worked our way up all the way there to that Iowa State game where things kind of uh, turned for the program. We, you know, we finished the season there at 6-6. Six and six. You know, we saw what it was like to, uh, you know, put the time in, put the effort in, and it started to pay off. And we started believing in each other. We believed in our coaches. And I think that just kind of carried over. And I think that Iowa State game right there is kind of what marked the turning point for the program. And we kind of moved along the following course for the next few years and ended up, uh, um, you know, with my, my class there uh, going to that uh, Motor City Bowl and uh, beating Toledo and uh, having the first bowl game there for the uh, university. Well, and, that, and that's the thing. And I think the one thing is, is that these guys, they weren't afraid of adversity. You know, they, they were willing to fight and they were willing to scratch and claw and do the things that you wanted to do. And you can't be afraid to fail, right? No. You know, you're going to fail. You know, with what we were doing, there was going to be some failures along the way because nobody did was doing what we were doing has ever done what we did and uh and that's the thing and you know now one of the things that's different all of a sudden if things don't go people's way they up and transfer or they leave or they you know they go somewhere else i mean just take a look over the years and in the last few years how many kids are transferring from schools because all of a sudden it didn't go instead of working through things and that's the thing in high school they're leaving high schools to go play at another high school because they're not the starter or whatever and that's one thing nobody wants to put in the time and effort like ryan was just saying yeah it's going to be hard and there's going to be adversity and that's the thing you appreciate about those guys yeah what we did was really hard we were in trailers we were in all that stuff and everything else you know but they didn't care you know, they didn't care. They were, you know, they wanted to work and do it. And that's the, one of the biggest differences between guys like Ryan and his era and what you have today. Yeah, this uh, the UConn football program, Ryan, is in good hands with Randy Edsel. I know you know that. We appreciate your time here on the show, and we look forward to seeing you against URI in a couple of weeks. Look forward to seeing everybody. Thanks for having me on. Coach, great luck. good luck this weekend. Okay, buddy. Look forward to seeing you. All right, it's Ryan Krug. We'll be back with more of the UConn Football Coaches Show with Randy Edsel on the UConn IMG Sports Network.
10 seconds. Stand by. You're hearing the UConn Football Coaches Show on the UConn IMG Sports Network. Here again, Mike Crispino. Welcome back to our Hartford Studios, WUCS 97.9 FM. That's the new home of UConn football. Mike Crispino here with Randy Edsel, the UConn coach. We just talked to Ryan Krug, an offensive lineman from the 2000 to 2004 team, a captain of the 04 team. We're talking about players of that era. But let's talk about the present now. You're back. You're in your second year. You look different. I mean, you look the same. You're not aging. I like that. But you are different in some way. Today, example, press conference, you were cracking a couple jokes. You actually got people laughing in there. I like that because it's disarming a little bit, but it gets people communicating. And you got people who are covering the team to communicate with you. Is that something you're trying to do, or is that just off the cuff? Well, I, I think, you know, times change and you everybody evolves. And um, I think that uh, it's different now than when it was when I first started. And uh, I think if you don't uh, if you don't evolve and you don't uh, adapt, you know, then uh, you're gonna you're gonna you know drive yourself nuts. And I'm not ready to drive myself nuts, <laughs> <laughs> even but though maybe speak- even though maybe people think that, that I am nuts. But uh, no. But speaking I mean, of which, how how are you handling the fact you got all these young guys? You know, you give up 56 points week one. You got Boise State, you know, staring you in the face in a road game. Uh, are you viewing this week to week? Are you looking long term over the 12 games? Let's see where we get to. What's your thought on that? Well, I know what the pl- I, you know I know what the plan is. You know I know the plan that I have, and I know what we have to do. And um, you know this isn't something where um, you can turn a battleship around, you know that easily. And uh, and what we have to do is uh, do the things. Ne- I have to continue to do the things necessary to get these guys to understand. And, you know, the, then again, as they continue to be in this program, you know, they're going to, they're going to teach the younger people, you know, we're still teaching people how to do things the way we need them done. And again, we don't have a big senior class. You know, we don't have guys that have been in the program guys have been in the program for one year. And, um, you know, so again, we have to do all those things, but again, with doing that, you know, we have to understand that, you know, as I told him, it's 12 one-game seasons, you know, so we're going to do everything we can to win the game this weekend and put the guys out there that can give us that opportunity. And then when this game's over, we look at the next one, we go from there. And, you know, at the end of the season, we'll see where we're at. And, um, you know, it's, it, in a way, it's good that we're getting uh, to go against these, these quality teams this early because I think that will benefit us as we still go as long as – the young men learn their lessons each and every week, and then they go and they look at it and study it and know that, hey, we got to get better at this the following week. Yeah, as long as they realize, okay, Boise State's a top 25 team, you follow that with Rhode Island. You can't take them for granted. Obviously, it's a football game. So, young team, you go out west. Let's talk about that psychology. The uh, team never been out 2,500 miles away from UConn to play a football game. So, What's the theory, what's the strategy psychology-wise when you take this team out there? Well, again, we're going to go out to win a football game. That's first and foremost. And, you know, what the thing is, what I want to see is I want to see us not make those same mistakes that we made the previous week. I want to see guys get better, you know, and as long as we can do that, you know, we'll see what the score is at the end of the game. And, um, you know, we're going to go out on Thursday. We're going to leave early to get out there because uh, of the two-hour time difference. Um, and then, um, you know, again, sometimes when you go there, it's just, you know, it's can we circle the wagons and be together the whole time? Because, you know, we don't have – it's not a home game. We're that far away from home. Probably not going to have that many fans out there. So now what we have to do is we have to draw upon each other to gain our strength and to gain our um, – passion and enthusiasm to stay you know out there in uh in the the moment and not get distracted by anything other than giving our best each and every play yeah you're a heavy underdog you're going to try to circle the wagon somehow try to stay in it early you're facing a team that's high octane again so what is different about Boise State than what you saw with Central Florida they both throw the ball around and they both score a lot of points yeah the 
uh, Brett Ripien is really good. I mean, he's he's probably more of your classic drop back quarterback. We might be seeing two but two of the best quarterbacks in the country, two of the top five or whatever quarterbacks in the country in the first two weeks of the season. Um, but he he's very accurate. You know, been very very impressed with his accuracy. They do a really good job. They give you a bunch of different personnel looks and uh, offensively, and they they know what they want to do. And they've had that system in place. And, you know, the thing that's impressive, you know, they've had a thousand yard rusher for nine straight years. So it's not just throwing the ball, it's running the ball as well. Mm-hmm. And then defensively, they have a really good scheme. Uh, you know, they, they, they do a lot of really good things. They have guys that really understand the scheme they're in. They do present you with some multiple uh, situations that you have to be uh, uh, ready for. And um, they execute really well. They're very sound, very fundamental. Uh, they run to the ball. So it, it, it's a it's going to be a tremendous challenge, but it's one that I know our guys are looking forward to. Yeah, no question about it. First road game for UConn this year in the football season at Boise State Saturday night, 10-15 Eastern time on WUCS 97.9 FM. Back with the coach with more on the UConn Football Coaches Show here on the UConn IMG Sports Network. UConn Football Coaches Show continues on the UConn IMG Sports Network. Once again, here's Mike Crispino. UConn at Boise State this Saturday night, 10 15 Eastern Time. Mike Crispino and Randy Edsel. So if you're the other guys and you're looking at what David Pindell did, uh, I'm assuming you're going to figure out a way to game plan against him. No, I'd probably just let him do what he was doing. You know, <laughs> you I hope they I would. would. I wouldn't do anything different <laughs> than what anybody did. But, dude, but would they no, do I, something no. out of the box, like spy on them and do stuff like that? Or what? well, I mean, again, people will try to take away, you know, what you do well, you know, and and if they do, we we have, I mean, you know, we got to have answers to, you know, what they try to do, and uh, you know, we'll have answers to what they might try to do, and but it, but it still comes down to, you know. We've got to execute, or the people we play have to execute, and usually whoever executes the best, you know, is going to win. And uh, so what we need to do is have a really good uh, two days, Wednesday and Thursday, before we take off out there, and then we have plenty of time to study the tape on our iPads on the way mm-hmm. out there and continue for our guys to get ready, and plenty of time to, you know, on the day of the game to, you know, we'll do a walkthrough at uh, Boise High School on Friday and Saturday we'll go over to see the blue turf so we see it before we go over there for the game and 
you know, and then the, the tough part about the trip is the return because we don't get back here till 7.30 on Sunday morning, be back at the facility at 8.30. So, you know, that day we're just going to have the kids come right off the buses when we get back to campus and do treatments and have something to eat, and then they're done for the rest of the day, and then Monday's their normal day off so we can get back, you know, to um, where we need to be for the, for the following week. And the same thing for the coaches, you know, come back in and, you know, go get rest because you can't, burn the candle at both ends and so coming 30. back is the tough part yeah the coaches are working as hard as anybody maybe more than most coaches and what most players do that's for sure well coach that wraps up our second of 10 shows we're doing with you this year and we really appreciate that uh thanks so much to ryan krug for uh for coming on with us it was good to talk to him wasn't it oh it sure is i love you know Ten he's, seconds. having those guys back is always great all right. Thanks to Randy Edsel. I'm Mike Crispino, and thanks for Five, joining us on the four, UConn IMG three, Sports Network. Two.